Let me introduce Ben. Uh, we've kind of been working our way down south. We started in Alaska. We had the last two presentations uh, from Washington. Now the next two are going to be here in California. Uh, Ben's from the Army Corps of Engineers. He's going to talk about the use of captive brood stock to supplement ESA listed coho in the Russian River. So uh, please welcome Ben. Hello, my name is Ben White, a uh, biologist for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I've actually only worked for the Corps for a couple months now, but I've been working on this program for about eight years. And I uh, just want to give you some insight to a coho recovery program that's just now out of its infancy stage and we're just starting to see some glimpses of success. Glimpses, mind you. Um, so the Russian River watershed is located in the Central California Coast ESU. It basically runs through southern Mendocino and Sonoma counties. Um, Warm Springs Hatchery, where the, the captive breeding portion of the program is located, is at the base of Lake Sonoma and Warm Springs Dam. Um, Lake Sonoma is one of two water supply reservoirs in the watershed, and the dam is managed and operated by the Army Corps of Engineers, and the facility is owned and completely funded by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, a little background on the facility. Um, we get all of our water from Lake Sonoma. We're able to draw it from fairly low levels of the lake. Um, it's a flow through system, so all of our efflu effluent goes into a settling pond where it's naturally filtered before returning um, to Dry Creek. And uh, yeah, we have a constant source of, of cold water year round. So we're really lucky to have this facility um, for a program like ours. And water temperatures, they're nowhere near as cold as Nome, Alaska, but 10 to 12 degrees Celsius year round, it's cold to us. Um, so just a little history on the decline of, of coho in the Russian River watershed. It's believed that historically somewhere around 32 streams supported wild runs of coho. And over the last you know, 10 to 20 years, that number's dramatically declined, like most of the stocks in this ESU. Um, and even with that declining number, the number of streams with three consecutive year class was really down to next to nothing. And with coho being on that real rigid three-year life cycle, once you start missing year classes, it's really hard to reestablish those unless you have you know, healthy adjacent populations, which in this case, we didn't. Um, so yeah, that, that one stream with three year classes is really how we jump-started our program, and I'll, I'll get to that. Um, so extinction of coho salmon in the Russian River watershed was essentially imminent without some sort of immediate intervention. So in 2001, state and federal agencies, along with nonprofit groups, collaborated to, be to begin the captive broodstock program. And I really want to drive home the point of this sort of collaborative partnership, um, this multi-agency partnership. Um, a number of the resource agencies represented here today are all major players in our um, program. Um, a number of the people that sit on our subcommittee are actually sitting in the room here today. So it's really representatives from all these groups that really drive all the major decisions um, and let us know what to do, when to do it, that sort of thing. And I can't leave out cooperating landowners. Um, almost the entire watershed is privately owned, so all of our efforts outside of the hatchery really have to be done in coordination with cooperating landowners, and that's everything from broodstock, broodstock capture to all of our releases to all of our monitoring efforts. We really have to establish and maintain these uh, healthy relationships with landowners. Um, so the principal goal of the program is to reestablish self-sustaining runs of native coho salmon um, back into streams that historically supported coho salmon um, within the watershed. Um, and there's two program components, the hatchery component, and that's the part that I oversee. Um, I spend pretty much all my time at the hatchery, but there's also the monitoring component. And that's an essential part of our program that really drives a lot of our release efforts, lets us know how productive each stream is, how many of these fish survive over the summer, over the winter. They do all the spawner surveys, all the um, in-stream characteristics in terms of flow and temperature, stuff like that. 
Um, and the monitoring component is run by the UC Cooperative Extension, but is now also funded by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, so real briefly, uh, the recovery hatchery model, this is just the life cycle of salmon. What we do is we go out and we collect juveniles during the summer months when the water levels are low, easy to capture. Um, we bring those fish into captivity where we can really increase survival, provide them with plenty of cold water, food, eliminate predation. We essentially turn a few fish into many fish and we take those fish that we produce and we stock them back out into streams that historically had coho salmon. Um, we're not trying to create a hatchery run of fish. We're trying to reestablish um, wild runs, self-sustaining runs of fish within the watershed. Um, broodstock collection. Um, this is just a picture of uh, some folks out collecting broodstock. We use hand sains, which are really low impact and non-invasive on the fish. Um, we go out in the summer months when the water levels are low, and we capture fish to bring back to the hatchery. And just to give you a sort of an idea of what our broodstock population has been comprised of over the years. Um, you can see that between 2001 and 2003, we were able to collect two to 300 fish from the wild to really jumpstart um, jump the program. Um, but beginning in 2004, the number of wild fish we, we encountered was, was literally next to nothing. So we're really lucky we started the program when we did. Um, even if we would have started this program about a year later, we would have been missing a year class and it would have been really hard to reestablish that year class. So since 2004, our broodstock population has really been reliant on captive fish. These are offspring of fish that were spawned, on the, spawned at the hatchery and just held over for broodstock purposes. Um, Beginning in 2007, you can see we started pulling fish from outside watersheds, um, and I'm going to get to that here in a little bit, and that's part of an outbreeding component. Um, it's an attempt to increase genetic diversity within our broodstock population. And in 2010, and I'm going to get to this as well, we started sort of revisiting this wild component. We started, we're starting to now see adults coming back and wild juveniles are starting to pop up throughout the watershed. So we're starting to bring those back, at, back into the hatchery um, and try to get away from um, a completely captive broodstock population. Um, so raising broodstock to maturity, uh, basically at about a year, age, a year of age, we, uh, we pit tag each fish, and that pit tag um, is, court, is in conjunction with a genetic sample that gets sent down to Dr. Garza and his lab. Um, we raise all of our fish completely in fresh water. Um, they never see salt water. Um, we raise them in these large 20-foot diameter tanks. And some actual improvements over the last few years is we've added many more of these tanks. We now have about 12 large circular tanks. We also have a building over our tanks that keep everybody sort of high and dry and comfortable. Um, and we have about 24 starter tanks. That's all sort of dedicated strictly to the coho program. We started supplementing their diet with krill, something that they would naturally eat out in the ocean. And we've seen a huge response to uh, the addition of krill to their diet. Um, much better growth rates, which has in turn um, resulted in better spawning success with our fish. Um, and then we do routine broodstock inventories. Basically go through every one of our fish quarterly, just tracking growth rates, health, development, that sort of thing. Keeping tabs on everyone, making sure they're still there. Um, ripeness sorting. Um, this, is, this is a tricky part of our program. Obviously in the wild these fish decide when to spawn, who to spawn with, and where to spawn. And in captivity that all falls on on my plate actually. Um, so we use ultrasound to determine not only the sex of the fish, but to monitor gonadal development. This is especially important with the females. Um, just like their sensitive nature in the wild, very sensitive in captivity, it's very difficult to determine when a female should be spawned. So we use ultrasound to monitor um, egg development. We can actually see when those eggs become hydrated, when they're actually starting to detach from the skeins, um, getting ready for, um, for spawning and stuff like that. Um, we also use a number of, of additional physical characteristics to determine spawn timing in terms of the soft, softness of the abdomen, um, coloration, um, you know, whether they're ovulating or not. It's sort of this, this series of factors that we use to determine when a female is ready or not. Um, we do use uh, GNRH implants for um, some of our fish. 
Um, obviously in captivity, some of these fish just don't get with the program. A lot of the females are delayed um, or they stall out. So we use the implants on females only on an as-need basis, um, but we use it on almost all of the males to provide reliable milk production and high volume of milk production. And then we actually use external disc tags for easy identification during spawning. Um, I'm going to get to our spawning matrix and stuff like that in the next slide, but it really makes it really makes the spawning effort a lot more efficient when I can just look in a tank and find male number 100 to spawn with a specific female instead of having to go through every fish, scan them for a specific pit tag. So that, that disc tag is correlated to that pit tag for each fish. Um, Breed stock spawning. So I think maybe some of this was covered yesterday, but um, all of our males are ranked for each, matri uh, for each female. We spawn according to a, a spawning matrix that's provided by Dr. Garza and his lab. Um, we don't spawn any fish at the half sibling level or greater. We spawn one female with up to four males, and each male is spawned up to four times in a year before we take them out of the matrix so that not one male is overrepresented during a, a spawning effort. And then we check motility on every male before we fertilize the eggs, making sure the sperm is viable, motile, moving, alive, healthy. And then we track survival rates of each full sibling group as um, um, separately through the swim up stage. So we've sort of customized these heat incubation trays, divided them into four quadrants. So one tray will be one female's eggs spawned with four different males. So we can actually tr track the success of not only each female, but every male um, spawn partner in our program. So if, if one of these sublots was really bad and poor and low survival rates, we can kind of attribute that to the male. Um, whereas if the whole lot was, was poor survival, we can attribute that to the female. So we can really track the success of every mating in our program. Oh, that was not the right button. Um, this is just an example of our spawning matrix. It's literally an Excel file where every one of our females is listed across the top row. And then every uh, column is a list of every male in our program. The highest male on the list is the highest priority, least related to that female. And the red is just to demonstrate fish related at the half sibling level or greater. And under no circumstance would we spawn those fish with that female. And this is an example of our matings with and without the matrix. So you can see that the spawning matrix really drives our spawning efforts. Um, if we were not using the matrix, uh, we would be inbreeding all over the place. Um, the, the Russian River stock was really genetically bottlenecked, depleted, um, very low diversity. So the spawning matrix is extremely important for us in terms of our spawning efforts. And you can see that with the matrix, well, we're well below the uh, the half sibling level in terms of our um, matings. Um, this is, brings us to our outbreeding effort. Um, a very small founding population, along with the absence of new genetic material being incorporated into the program, has resulted in very low genetic diversity among our broodstock population. This was kind of referring back to that graph, whereas in 2004 we stopped seeing any wild fish, we stopped bringing any outside genetic material into the program. So we had this sort of depleted um, source population and we were spawning according to the breeding matrix. So we were mixing and matching all we could, increasing variation, but our diversity was kind of at a standstill. Um, we weren't really adding that sort of outside wild component into the program. Um, so it was decided in 2008 that 25% of our spawning effort would be dedicated to outbreeding the Russian River stock um, with the neighboring Alima Creek stock. And Alima Creek is sort of synonymous with the Lagunitas system as well. They kind of connect before they hit the ocean. And it's considered one of the, the healthier, more intact populations in this ESU. Although over the past few years, they've also seen a decline in numbers. Um, but it made sense for us to use this stock for our outbreeding efforts. Uh, I think it's believed that historically, when these populations were abundant and healthy, there was probably a certain level of straying and interbreeding between these stocks anyways. So this, was, uh, this made sense for us in terms of bringing in an outside stock for um, outbreeding efforts. 
And this is a graph just, so I think the, the scale on the bottom is a little off actually. Um, the 0.25 is actually supposed to be right under the arrow, but it's supposed to demonstrate sort of the health and the diversity of the two stocks. And you can see that the Russian River stock is really far um, on the right side of the x-axis, meaning very low diversity, very few family groups, and the Alima Creek stock is much more to the left on the x-axis, a lot higher diversity, a lot more family groups. Um, so really, uh, hopefully a benefit to our program to bring in this stock and on a small scale to start interbreeding them with the Russian River um, coho. And we have seen some early success in our outbreeding efforts. Um, this is comparison of egg to fry survival rates between Russian River females and Alima Creek females. Um, so we've been doing, this is our fourth year of spawning and we actually just finished spawning last week so I don't have all the data from this year's spawn effort, but you can see over three years, um, Alima Creek females have outperformed Russian River females significantly. Um, our egg to fry survival rates is basically a product of our eye up rate, our hatch rates, and our swim up rates. And across the board, they've always outperformed them in terms of early life stage survival rates. And even when I'm dealing with these fish and spawning this fish, there's a real a much more consistent development with the Alima Creek fish. They're, they develop in a much more regular pattern. They're a lot easier to determine when to spawn, um, whereas the Russian River fish are just kind of really all over the place. Um, so I think this has been a huge sort of addition to our program in terms of increasing diversity, and I think we're, we're starting to see that in not only in the hatchery, but hopefully in the wild as well. Um, outbreeding summary, offspring from OC females um, have significantly higher early life stage survival rates than Russian River females. Um, but we have seen similar early life stage survival rates among offspring from Alima Creek males and Russian River males spawned with the same female. So one thing we've been doing is what we're calling a paired outbreeding study and we're taking one female whether it be Russian River or Alima Creek, and spawning her with two um, different males or two different stocks of males. So if you remember that incubation tray divided into four quadrants, we would take one female's eggs, spawn her with two Alima Creek males, two Russian River males, use the eggs as sort of our control um, to see if there was any differences based on the, the male's input to the offspring. And we really haven't seen any significant differences, subtle differences, but nothing significant. So really, it comes down to the health and the viability of the eggs as opposed to the sperm quality. And this is the first year, we just finished spawning, but this being our fourth year of outbreeding, we're actually using F1 hybrids created from our first um, spawn season of outbreeding. Um, and it's really neat to see that um, early data collection is suggesting really similar survival rates between our F1 hybrid fish and our Alima Creek females. Um, we're literally all of our offspring are in the egg alevin stage as we're speaking, so we're still collecting data, but it's looking like the F1 hybrids are performing on the same level of the Alima, as the Alima Creek females were. So this outbreeding effort seems to be um, benefiting the program. This is a little graph on the juvenile production history. Um, on the, the left-hand y-axis, we have the number of fish we've produced. On uh, the right-hand y-axis, we have the number of females spawned. And you can see this really kind of symbolizes not only the growth of our production, but the growth of the program over the years. I mean, early on, we are still trying to figure out what we were doing, how to raise these fish, how to spawn these fish. We've really gotten better at what we're doing over the years, and our production has really shown. Um, I'd like to take all the credit for this, but there's been some major changes that have gone on the hatchery to uh, gone on at the hatchery to get us to this point. Um, some of those are just the inclusion of, of more circular tanks, so we can not only raise more fish, but we can raise them at lower densities, so we can improve growth rates, improve the maturation process. We've added things like filtration to our incubation stacks to remove a lot of the sediment and silt. We've actually started treating our eggs with formalin um, to prevent fungal growth. Coho eggs are extremely susceptible to fungus. Um, the addition of krill to the diet was a big one, and then over the last few years, the incorporation of the outbreeding effort has really driven up our production numbers. 
So juvenile releasing and tagging, we release juveniles into now about 20 different tributaries throughout the watershed, three different times of the year, um, spring and fall of their first year. So these are zero plus fish going out as a fingerling or an advanced fingerling. And then we also do smolt releases. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. All of our fish receive um, adipose fin clip and coated wire tags. And then approximately 10% of them receive pit tags. So we have sort of an extensive pit tag monitoring um, setup on a number of our creeks that in include not only all the antenna arrays, but downstream migrant trapping and stuff like that. And then we actually pit tag all of our fish according to these genetic cross types that we're um, producing so that we can see if we can evaluate any potential differences in post-release growth, movement, and survival among these different cross types. And I wish I had some data on that, early data suggesting that some of these hybrid groups are um, surviving better, but that's something that's more of a monitoring question. This is our annual uh, juvenile releases by life stage. So this is basically a breakdown of when we release our fish. Um, and there's really pros and cons to both of these, all of the all three of these different strategies. Um, obviously, for our spring release, the fingerling stage, um, you get those fish out early. They spend less time in the hatchery and more time in the wild, which is, is really what we want, ultimately. Um, you know, they're subjected to natural selection early on. We avoid domestication effects at the hatchery. Um, the downfall to those is you have much higher mortality rates. These fish have to oversummer in some of these creeks that tend to dry up sometimes in the, in the summers. Um, but you get, you get very fit fish if they can survive um, throughout the year in the freshwater system. Um, and you get very low stray rates. They have to spend a year in that creek, so they really have enough time to imprint on those creeks and return to those creeks. Now with our small releases, obviously they spend a lot more time in the hatchery, so they're subjected to selection effects, domestication effects, not to mention just the time, the space that it takes to take care of them. And then you also have the whole situation with imprinting those fish. You can't just release smolts out into the creeks and expect them to return to those creeks as spawning adults likely they're gonna to return to the hatchery. So you have to have some sort of imprinting technique with the smolts. So most of our fish go out in the fall of their first year. That bypasses those really hot, critical summer months, but it still gives them about six months in the freshwater system to imprint on the creek so that they know where to come back to. And we don't have to keep them at the hatchery for a full year. So over 50% of our fish go out in the fall of their first year. But we really have a sort of spread the risk mentality. We're, not, we're never gonna put all of our fish out at one life stage. We've kind of spread that across a number of different life stages in case something goes wrong with one of them. Then you kind of always have a, insurance policy. From the hatcheries to the streams, this is probably my favorite time of the year. It gets me out of the hatchery and into these creeks. Um, <laughs> for our spring and our fall releases, we use these water-filled aerated backpacks and we literally hike the fish throughout the entire stretch of the creek and we're looking for high quality habitat, deep pools, lots of structure, large woody debris, and we're essentially scattering these fish as much as we can. Um, we're trying to ensure survival every step of the way since these fish have to spend a significant amount of time in that freshwater system. For our smolts, uh, like I mentioned, you have to have a way to imprint these fish on the creeks. So we've been playing around with a couple different techniques. Uh, we do streamside imprinting tanks where we literally set up small circular tanks next to a creek. Obviously you have to have the right situation, the right landowners, uh, power, stuff like that. So we're pumping water from the creek into these tanks. We'll hold groups of fish in a tank for anywhere from three to four weeks at a time, hoping that they'll key in on um, the characteristics of that creek water before we release them back into the creek. And we've also been using flashboard dams. Uh, we've established some relationships with some landowners where they've allowed us to um, you know, block up these flashboard dams. We hold the smolts in there for same thing, three to four weeks at a time before pulling the dam boards and letting them go. Um, there's just a lot less control with the flashboard dam situation. Those fish are, 
are prone to predation, um, prone to changes in flows and storm events. So we've had to build fish screens and stuff that'll let water out but not fish. But really the flashboard dams aren't meant for holding fish back. So those have kind of been, we've had up and down success with the flashboard dams. We're really starting to lean towards the stream side imprinting tanks because it's just a much more controlled environment. We know how many fish we put in. If we lose any fish over that three to four week period, we know how many fish we release. Um, it's in no predation, no, it's, it's just a, a much more controlled situation and we're going to try to set up more of these imprinting tanks um, this year on a few other creeks. And adult releases, this has kind of been a, I'm not going to get too far into this, I think uh, Carlos is going to talk about this a little bit after I do, but uh, long story short, um, we've come up with every year we get some excess brood stock, uh, more than what we need to spawn at the hatchery. Instead of let, just letting these fish expire naturally or go to waste, we figure why not put them out there and see what happens. And I think early on nobody really expected a whole lot from this, but every time we've done this it's been successful. Really we're taking these fish that were raised in captivity their entire lives. Um, fresh water their entire lives. We take them out to sort of the lower portion of these creeks. They still have that innate ability to swim upstream, find the spawning grounds, find a mate, spawn successfully. And it seems like every time we've done this, it's been successful. So it's a really, um, it's a really valuable recovery strategy um, because you don't have to deal with the whole spawning effort and the associated egg care and the raising of juveniles and the tagging and the marking and, and really you allow for natural mate selection and the offspring are technically wild fish. They're subjected to natural selection as soon as they come out of the gravel. Um, so there's definitely a huge benefit to this adult release and I, I think we're going to continue this effort in the future. Um, early on it's just kind of been sporadically. We've had fish, we'll, we'll put them out there, but over the last few years we've really sort of had an organized focused effort on this and one of the places we've been doing it is in Salmon Creek which is a small coastal water watershed just south of the Russian River. Um, we've been doing it for four years now. Every year these fish have spawned successfully. There's now a sort of a monitoring component that goes along with it. Um, taking genetic samples from the fish that we're finding so we can actually look and see who was mating with who. Um, and I'll, I won't touch on that too much because I think Carlos is going to follow up on that. And recovery in progress. This is basically adult coho, minimum adult coho returns to the Russian River watershed over the last 10 or so years. You can see from 2000 to about 2008, we were really just treading water. Um, I, I like to say we're just preventing extinction. Um, we weren't even really in the ballpark of recovery. Um, but over the last two years, those numbers have dramatically increased. And even though they're only in the hundreds right now, obviously for recovery, we need those up into the thousands. Um, it's definitely a, a move in the right direction. And, and this is just a minimum, a, a minimum count. So I think we can look at this so this current number for this past winter, or the winter we're currently in, is right around 200. But once we analyze all of our pit tagging data, um, I think that we can extrapolate and estimate that number to be much higher, quite a few times higher than that. Um, for instance, if we pit tag 10% of a certain release group and we get 10 unique detections on an antenna, well, we can assume that there was probably around 90 non-pit tagged fish associated with those. So once we analyze all of the data, um, we can estimate these returns to be a lot higher. And it's, it's not where we want to be, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. And for us, it's extremely exciting because um, it's been years since we've seen any sort of significant number coming back to the Russian River watershed. And over the last two years, um, we've really seen a jump in these. And these these last two years are from juvenile releases of 80 and 90,000 fish. So we really haven't even gotten into our adult returns from our releases of 160 and our 170,000 fish, which were our last two juvenile releases. So these numbers should continue to shoot up over the next couple of years. And I just want to really acknowledge um, everybody who sits on our subcommittee meeting, not only that, but the hatchery staff and our monitoring uh, crew that Really, it's a, it's a team effort when it comes to this program. And that's it. Any questions? Let's, yeah, let's thank Ben first. <laughs> have a few minutes for questions, and then we're going to take our um, lunch break.
break. So, okay. Let's see a bunch of hands up. Now. Thank you, Ben. That was really good. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to ask one. Okay, thank and, you. <laughs> um, when you plant the fingerlings, and you, you um, do you have um, communication like with the landowner or the water manager? <laughs> So that where you're planting them, you know that there's going to be water there for a few months. Yeah. So for our spring releases, we've really we've really only focused those releases on streams that tend to stay wet year round and have minimal sort of withdrawals and, and human impact on them. Um, so our spring releases are really now only dedicated to streams that do have flow year round and any stream that has a tendency to dry up over the summer um, we'll, we'll just put all of our efforts into a fall release for that stream. In your efforts of uh, quarterly monitoring what type of anesthetic do you use and what type of uh, mortality rates do you have of your captive brood stock? Uh, we use MS222 for anesthetic and pre-spawn mortality is probably around 10% maybe. There's really only two, two periods of, of high mortality um, with our brood stock and it's, it's at about a year of age when we pit tag them and we transfer them from the starter tanks to the large circular tanks. Uh, we get a, a little pulse of mortality there. Some fish just don't acclimate to those larger tanks and those higher flows. And then the other sort of pulse of mortality is the couple months right before spawning when their bodies are going through all the gonadal development and a lot of pressure on the internal organs. We get what we call it's a swim bladder swim syndrome where we get this overinflated swim bladder, a real constricted swim bladder anteriorly, and the fish really it loses its sense of buoyancy. It can't keep itself upright. Um, it's something that we really don't know the complete reason behind, um, but it's, it's right before spawning and it's r about two to three months right before spawning and those are kind of the two pulses of, of mortality pre-spawn. Okay. question in the back. Yeah, I have a question in the back. Go ahead. Don Meamber, um, I have a question about the returns. Uh, you talked about uh, moving the, the juveniles up into the uh, tributaries, packing them up there. Mm -hmm. Have you found that the fish are returning into those tributaries, and do you have, do you have problems with them returning back to Warm Springs Hatchery? Um, yes and yes. Um, we, now, after the last couple of years, we're starting to see uh, adults coming back, and we're finally starting to see wild juveniles throughout the watershed. We're seeing them not only in our release streams, so they are returning to the streams we're putting them in, but we're actually starting to see fish in streams that we never even put any effort into. So there is a certain level of straying going on. Um, the fish returning to the hatchery, we, a number of our release streams are tributaries to Dry Creek, which is the creek the hatchery is on. So we get a lot of fish returning to that system, and whether flows aren't right or they just take a wrong turn, a lot of them do end up at the hatchery. And when I say a lot, I mean in the order of 20 or 30 a year. Um, so we're not seeing significant numbers coming back to the hatchery, but we do get a, 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 fair, a, a small number every year. Caitlin has a question, and then Rick, and then I think we're going to take our lunch break. Is this on? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what the limiting factors are in the Russian River watershed and whether or not you think there's evidence that any of them have been being addressed over the last 10 years, and more specifically the last two years? Yeah, I would say the, the, the biggest limiting factor is water and the lack of water. And if there is water, it's, it's low quality, it's high in temperature. Um, this is an area with not only a lot of people, but a lot of agriculture, a lot of vineyards and wineries. And the coho reliant on these small tributaries. Um, there's a lot of people sucking water out of those creeks, whether it be for personal use or for agriculture. And that seems to be the biggest limiting factor for coho in the watershed. And they are starting to address that. I mean, it's just come into the light over the last couple of years in terms of wineries and vineyards drawing water for frost protection and stuff, which just coincides with out migration period for coho salmon. Um, so I don't know exactly what they're doing to remedy that, but they are addressing that, that issue. 
Okay, Rick told me his question was um, was addressed. So Morgan gets the last question, and I'll tell you about lunch. Thanks. Hey, yeah, that was an excellent presentation. Thank, Thank you for sharing that. And um, you know, I, I guess one of the things that we're concerned with around here, if the supplementation program was to move forward, is you know what what happens when the screw gets turned back off in terms of the supplementation effort. And so I'm I'm wondering if you guys have recovery targets that you're looking for, or if there's any any of the multiple watersheds that you guys are planning fish in that you uh, plan to turn the screw off sooner and evaluate? And no, that's a good question. Um, our target goals, I th correct me if I'm wrong, Michael or Carlos, but I, I think they're up to maybe 10,000 for the Russian River now, so we have a, quite a long way to go. But uh, as we, I mean, our whole, the ultimate goal is that we can kind of back off what we're doing at some point. Um, Michael alluded to this in his uh, presentation this morning, is that this isn't a long-term answer. Eventually, we would like the fish to take over and start to um, you know, reestablish their self-sustaining runs, and we can kind of back off what we're doing. And we've already started to see that last year where we're getting adults coming back and we're starting to see wild juveniles, and we don't want to just stick a bunch of program fish right on top of these wild fish. So I think over the next few years, as the numbers start to increase, we are definitely going to have to rethink our release strategies and whether it's avoiding certain parts of creeks or just avoiding creeks altogether that have uh, wild origin fish in them and maybe start putting our efforts into other creeks in the watershed or other watersheds completely. I think that's definitely on the table and that's probably definitely going to happen in the, ne the next couple years. Thanks much. Let's thank Ben and let's talk lunch.